Welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Maya, if you haven't met me. I'm, the, I'm a member of the JFN Israeli staff. We have a few other members joining us today. And I work on the programs and content development. Um, this session is actually a modification of a program that was scheduled to be um, in the Israel Idea Festival back in October. But as you know, it, um, it was uh, changed. It became, instead of a face-to-face -face event, it became a virtual event. And it ended up that there were too many issue exploration sessions competing against each other. And we decided to give this topic actually the respect that it deserves. And so uh, here we are today. Um, it's, it's a topic that is crucial and important, aging. Um, this became apparent with issues arising during the pandemic period, but also with the rapid growth of the older population predicted, predicted to continue through 2050 and beyond. And it's part of a larger area of discussion that we strive to enable among JFN members, not only on aging, but beyond that, on healthcare, well-being, and the intersectionality of all these areas of giving, of all the areas of giving with these uh, top topics. Um, before we go any further and uh, start with our actual program and the speakers, um, I wanted to kind of get us in the right setting. And I would like to share with you a short video. It's a scene from the Pixar movie, Up. Quite a sight, huh, Ellie? Up, oh, mail's here. <laughs> Shady Oaks retirement. Oh, brother. Hmm. Fredrickson, need any help there? Uh, no. Uh, yeah, tell your boss over there that you boys are ruining our house. Well, just to let you know, uh, my boss would be happy to take this old place off your hands and uh, for double his last offer. What do you say to that? <laughs> uh, take that as a no, then. I believe I made my position to your boss quite clear. You poured fruit juice in his gas tank. <laughs> yeah, that was good. Here, let me talk to him. You in the suit. Yes, you. Take a bath, hippie. I am not with him. This is serious. He's out to get your house. Tell your boss he can have our house. Really? When I'm dead. 
I'll take that as a maybe. <laughs> okay, so uh, I hope you enjoyed that, and that was just to get us in the mood. Um, and um, now we're um, actually uh, we're starting with our with our keynote speaker. Um, I want to encourage you just before uh, I present Yossi to you to write any questions that you have in the chat. Oh, sorry, I need to put this on speaker view. Yeah, um, to put any uh, questions that you might have um, in the chat. And at the end of the presentation, um, I will moderate um, a Q&A. So our first speaker is Yossi Hyman, who is the CEO of JDC Israel Eshel. And Yossi will provide us an up-to-date overview of the field of aging in Israel. So um, Yossi, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Maya, and good evening. And thank you all for having me here. Um, so just let me know that you see my presentation. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. OK. Um, so uh, I present you uh, this evening about optimal aging in Israel for 100 years of life. And the reason why we talk about 100 years of life is that from four years ago, every third child who get birth in Israel is going to live more than 100 years. And this is something that we think that uh, the nation and the municipalities are not ready for. And that's why we try to move uh, the state of Israel to a better <clears throat> preparedness and uh, to prepare itself to, for an op optimal aging in the future. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, this evening about the challenging of aging in Israel. Um, the challenge of aging and uh, the pandemic, the COVID-19, which affected dramatically older adults. Um, I'm going to talk about the social sector, and as an example, JDC Israel and JDC Eshel, as an example of the contribution of the social sector to advancing a very complex uh, challenges uh, solutions with the, with the other sector, uh, specific with uh, the government. And at the end, I'll show you uh, JDC Eshel's strategic roadmap uh, coordinated with the relevant ministries uh, for promoting optimal aging in Israel and the <clears throat> implications of uh, Resolution 127 adopted by the uh, government of Israel in July 2021. So first of all, a few words about the challenge. Um, in 2015, there were in Israel 1 million people, which are defined as older adult. By the way, all over the, over, all over the world, when you say older adult or elderly, um, we are talking about age 65 and above. So in 2015, there were uh, 1 million people in Israel. Today, by the, in 2019, there were 1.2 million. Uh, in 2040, uh, it's going to double itself for two, uh, two uh, million. Uh, and in 2065, there will be uh, three million. But the more, um, more challenging um, a parameter here is the percentage of the people who are age 85 and above you can understand uh, why. So if, if, if in 2015, 85 and above were 13% of the 1 million, it's going to be 18% in 2040, and it's going to be 24% in 2065. And because expected uh, uh, in the number of older adults with fun uh, functional decline, and if you, you look here in the, in the slide, uh, which were 10% in 2020, so it's going to be 21% in 2025, 32% in 2030, and 43% in 2035. And all of it's happened because uh, people today more and more can live many years with a chronic uh, disease. And of course, people who are with chronic disease and who are 85 and above, they are cost more usually and in average 
to themselves, to the family, to the community, and of course, to the nation. Um, the coronavirus, as I said before, hit dramatically and mostly the older adult. Uh, let me just say that uh, in Israel and more or less it's all over the world, the percentage of the people who were died from the pandemic till today, 95% uh, um, of those who were died are 60 and above, and 85% are 70 and above. It means that, again, this is the uh, pandemic mostly of, of uh, older adults. And we in JDC Eshel, we operated and we, we have made three uh, big surveys with the ERI, it's a research institute, uh, during the pandemic, one in uh, May 2020. My one, the second one was in August 2020, and the third one in July 2021. So we have a continuum surveys, and we can uh, have a lot of uh, um, lesson learned and uh, a lot of um, uh, understand the situation. And by the way, we share the knowledge about those uh, surveys with the ministries, with the municipalities, with the academy, with the social sector. So what we have found in those uh, surveys, first of all, that approximately 220,000 older adults experience multi-dimensional decline even after the restriction uh, were lifted. And when we talk about uh, multi-dimensional, we are talking about three levels of uh, deterioration. We are talking about functionality, we are talking about emotions, st emotional state, and we are talking about financial uh, situation. Um, so, uh, and, and about 4% of the older adult, uh, which the number in Israel, it's about 45,000 people, experience decline across all the three indicators. Second, what we have found in those survey, uh, what are the risk predictors to deteriorate from uh, the pandemic and what are the resilience predictors um, so the risk predictors are financial difficulties. We know that people who suffer from financial difficulties um, almost um, um, uh, deteriorate from other reason, from a functionality reason or emotional reason. Deconditioning and pre-deconditioning, and by the way, when you stay at home, when you are in a quarantine or things like that, you suffer more from deconditioning because you get out less, you walk less, you sometimes you, uh, move, you operate your brain less, so you can uh, deteriorate from physical point of view and from cognitive point of view and for older adults. It's very, very relevant. Arab society, even if they, the, the, the people itself uh, do not suffer from financial, financial difficulties, people with no family and people over 40, 74. So those are what we have found in those surveys, the risk predict. On the other end, we found the resilience predictors. First of all, the digital literacy, uh, which uh, improved dramatically your ability to be resilient. And three very, very important and major elements. First of all, physical engagement with the community with all the, the precaution, uh, put masks, stay two meters between each other, but get out from your home, from your apartment, from your room, and uh, uh, get engagement with, uh, with the one friend, two friends, and so on. Second, physical e exercise at least twice a week. And the third uh, one is meaningful leisure activities. And by the way, you can do all of them together, get out with your one or two friends, do a physical uh, fitness uh, activities, and play chess together or study Bible or things that uh, uh, give you meaning for uh, to life. And by the way, we found through the surveys that those who uh, um, make all those three parameters, physical uh, engagement, physical exercise, and meaningful leisure activities, their potential for deteriorate versus those who do not uh, do it is 58% to 11%. So it means that it's less, five times less if you do all those 
uh, activities. That's why it's so important, and that's why we share this knowledge with the ministries, and some of them adopted some of those um, recommendations in their activities. Now I want to talk a few uh, words about um, the importance of the uh, social sector and JDC Israel and JDC Eshel as one of the examples. So JDC Israel vision is to care for, uh, for all the, uh, the, uh, the Israel population in order to close social gaps and promote resilience in social justice. And uh, JDC Israel, which, uh, which is the uh, oldest branch, we have five branches in uh, JDC Israel. Eshel is the, the older one, founded in 1969. So we are a governor partnership with the longest and widest exper ex expertise and risk which uh, in develop, developing and implementing services for older adults in Israel. Um, by the way, most of the services which were uh, developed and established in Israel, like daycare centers, uh, supportive communities, and dozens other were uh, developed by Eshel with the government. And our mission is to improve the well-being of vulnerable older adults in Israel by advancing their autonomy, functionality, and they're independent. And as you can see, we are a very special cooperation between JDC and some ministries. In JDC Eshel example, our board of directors are from the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Welfare, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Social Equality, and the National uh, Insurance Institute. Um, two years ago, in a very, very um, uh, special uh, process, we made a table with those, uh, um, those partners with, from the government and some others, and we offer them to try to define in Israel what is, how we want to define optimal aging in Israel, and what are the measurements, what is going to be the dashboard, the indicator for optimal aging. So we, um, we were seven ministries and JDC Eshel and JDC Brugdel around the table. And we made a, a big, big researches. We study from uh, a 108 academic researches, surveys, paper which were published in the last five years. For example, uh, if you know the share surveys, which is uh, which uh, uh, have on a yearly basis uh, during the last 15 years uh, measured has me has measured 140,000 people from the OECD. Uh, it's about 40 countries, include the, the state of Israel, and you you can see some other like um, uh, one survey FHS in the United States, which has uh, started 71 years ago, and you can see. Uh, some other from Canada, from Ireland, from Norway, from England, and so on. So it's a very, very big research that we, uh, we made. And I'll show you now the governmental decision or government resolution 127, which adopted in July 19, 2021, anonymous, um, anonymously by, by the government, even though it was uh, it was. Uh, brought to the government by six minister, ministers, include the prime minister and the, um, and the finance minister. So in the governmental uh, resolution, there are four points. The first one and the, the important ones, uh, excuse me, is to, uh, to adopt the map of national indicator for optimal aging in Israel. And this is the map. These are the six indicator, national indicator, Two of the indicators related to the health, uh, fam um, health uh, family, one is healthy lifestyle, uh, lifespan as uh, the, the percentage of years in good health from the age 65 till the end of life. And you can see that even though female in last, uh, life expectancy, expectancy in Israel for female is uh, four years more than uh, male, you can see that when we are talking about percentage of years in good health, uh, men live in, a, in much, uh, much higher good health, 56% uh, of the rest of the life from 65 to the end of life, and female just 47%. Second one is functionality. 
uh, difficulty with activity of daily living. There are six, um, uh, six uh, uh, basic uh, activities of every human uh, being to eat, to walk, to dress, and so on. So 17% in Israel uh, has diffi have difficulties with ADL, and 33% of the older adults in Israel have difficulty with uh, instrumental activity of daily living. For example, if to eat is ADL, to cook is IADL. Uh, by the way, the color here, uh, red is below the average of the OECD, yellow is the similar the average of the OECD, and in a minute you see some indicator which is green, so we are above the OECD average. Two for, uh, belong to the family of meaning, loneliness. You can see that Israel is red uh, compared to the OECD. And quality of life, uh, this is a measurement that the, the, the uh, share survey uh, measure all over the OECD. So you can see the CASP, uh, the P is the happiness, um, but the, the, the measurement is much more complex. And two uh, indicator uh, belong to the family of economic resilience. One is objective, we describe or define the percentage of people who live in poverty, it's about 21% in Israel. Uh, and one is subjective, the ability to cope unexpected uh, $1,000 next month. So they ask people, do you think that you can uh, cope it? And you can see that 40% struggle to cope it financially. Um, these six indicators were accepted by the government. And, but those, those um, um, uh, indicators are very difficult to be affected by programs or by budgets. Uh, that's why we put another 80 uh, predictive indicator for optimal aging. Here in this slide, you can see 12 of them. Uh, the government decision um, um, uh, show those a, a predictive indicator, but it's not part of the governmental decision. And here you can see uh, some that Israel is green in good BMI, smoke, alcohol, and uh, so on. And uh, those are the, the family, financial capabilities, activity lifestyle, healthy lifestyle, healthy management, and a, a cross-cutting multiplier uh, that influence all group of indicator is the digital uh, literacy. So this. This is the first uh, point of the governmental decision. The second point is that they order, the government ordered our team led by JDC Eshel uh, to continue to develop the national indicator and recommend metric goals um, and to uh, create an ongoing assessment of the indicator uh, with the uh, Central Bureau of Statistics. And uh, we are going to put the first uh, assessment for the uh, on the table of in uh, of the government in October 2022 uh, in the day of the older adult in October 2022 and uh, we are going to show the status report to the government every two years uh, with a global comparison to the OECD but not just that we need to put the uh, goals a metric goals and to make an ongoing assessment the government order us by the way, I can tell you that we were uh, behind all of this uh, uh, governmental decision and we asked them to put it in uh, those points that the assessment will, will refer to demographic groups such as population, age, gender, geographic region, or any other relevant sector. And for example, you saw before that there is a big difference between male and female in percentage of uh, uh, good, uh, good health uh, till the end of life. So if a female suffer more than a male, so it's not just to put the goals, put a specific goal to close the, the gaps between male and female. Or another example, I showed you that 17% uh, in Israel suffer from ADL. Uh, so when you go in, inside the, the data, when we are talking about the Jewish sector, we are talking about 40%, 14% who suffer from uh, ADL. But when we go to the Arab sector, 26% suffer from ADL. So it's not enough to move or to put an, a goal for the average. Uh, we were uh, ordered to put a specific goal for big gaps for population, age, and gender.
And last uh, part of the governmental decision is uh, to guide the government uh, ministries, especially those who provide services for to older adults like the health and social ministries and these national insurance and so on, to direct their actions and intervention to impact the national indicator and decrease the gaps among relevant population group reflected in the indicator. And I think that uh, you can imagine that it's a very, very unique uh, position of the social sector to bring together a uh, few ministries. This is something uh, which is the uh, unprecedented uh, um, because there is no equivalent uh, dashboard, not for poverty in Israel, uh, not to uh, in, in uh, education, not in uh, poverty, not in abuse. So uh, this dashboard and this uh, res resolution 127, it's the first when we, when we talk about um, a big um, um, a social uh, issues like optimal aging. Um, last slide. So um, uh, for the years 2021 to the year 2025, uh, JDC Eshel strategic roadmap for to promote uh, for promoting optimal aging in Israel includes three levels. The first one is the impact that we define to increase the independence for older adults, and as I mentioned before, deterioration can happen from health. Uh, risk because of uh, health risk, social risk, and economical risk. A uh, second level is the national indicator, which approved by the government. And the third level, not to stay and to remain just in the strategic level, uh, we offer the government to lead a eight large-scale initiatives, what we call LSI. Five of those LSI related to improve the older adult, personal older adult itself, which are health management in preventive uh, methodological, which is very low uh, methodological in Israel, concept in Israel, quality employment, because employment, imp uh, when, you, you, when people continue to be employed af even after 65, of course their economic resilience improve, but even their, uh, the meaning of life and uh, for many researchers, we know that even the health from physical and cognitive point of view, uh, people who continue to be employed are in a, in a much, much better situation uh, compared to those who are unemployed. Digital literacy, because it's the reading and writing uh, of the 21 century. Uh, social involvement, uh, specific for those 80,000 people in Israel who in every survey say, when, when I have problem, I have no one to uh, get uh, for. I don't have a family or I have family, but they ignore me or I don't know how, how to uh, get to, uh, to a social worker and so, or to the health system and so on. So we have a big LSI which tried for the first time to give a solution for those what we call who are not armed under the spotlight, Shem Lotachatapanas, retirement preparedness, when Israel was established in uh, 65, defined as the uh, mandatory age to retirement, the life expectancy in Israel was 66.5. Today, when life expectancy in Israel in, 19, in 2019 was um, 83, and by the way, if you reach to 65 and you haven't died from zero to 65, your life expectancy is going to be 86, 87 if, if you're female. So you still have 22, 21, 22 years to live. It means that like all the other part of your life, when you are a child, when you are an adult, you have to prepare people for life. Nowadays, the, the, if you continue to be uh, to, to retire when you are 65 or 67, the government needs to prepare you for the new life from financially point of view, from a digital point of view, from health point of view, and so on. So those are five LSI in the personal level, and three large-scale initiatives which we define and we try to uh, push the government and, and relevant ministries to, uh, uh, to do with us. Uh, and one is to improve the nursing care um, model in Israel. By the way, there are two big, 
big uh, challenge, first of all, number of nursing care is going, uh, is going to uh, double itself in the next 15, 20 years. And Israel is not ready for that. And by the way, people, um, uh, people from abroad, from Thailand or from uh, Poland or from other nations, uh, is not it's not a good uh, solution because uh, their uh, salary is increased dramatically, and, and Israel don't, uh, doesn't want to bring here uh, more 150,000 uh, immigrants from from abroad. So we need to uh, improve the nursing uh, 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 care um, uh, uh, system. And the second challenge of the nursing care system is that as much as the older adult deteriorate, the nursing, uh, the nursing um, uh, firm or the nursing organization earn more. Why? And, and we want to to depend to to the uh, to delay the, the, the dependency and to increase independence. And when the, the, uh, when, uh, the, 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 the companies earn more as much as the deterioration of the older adult uh, is higher, it's, uh, it's moving against the impact that we define to increase independence for older adult. The second uh, system that we want to improve is the uh, municipalities. And here we have a very, very big, um, model in LSI, which we called uh, age-friendly cities or Muni, municipality 100, and I explained before why 100, and we want to change the DNA of the municipalities. And last thing is the affordable housing. Uh, many older adults in the community live in, a, in a, an apartment which is not affordable for them. So we try with the uh, housing ministry to, to change it in, in the next five or 10 years to move those LSI initiatives. Last thing to say that till today, uh, or till uh, two years ago, JDC Eshel and the rest of the branches in JDC Israel uh, developed new services. We continue to develop new services, but when we talk about large scale initiatives, new services and developing new services is just part of LSI. You cannot, you cannot improve the uh, national indicator just with services. We need to uh, put here uh, a, um, even uh, cross-cutting tools like regulation, training, specific technology that we uh, um, uh, have to develop for each of those LSI, raising awareness, for example, People think, ah, oh, retirement, yes, I'm going to retire as a calf, what a fun. And a year after, later, they, they are sorry about it, but they cannot regret. So we have to raise the awareness for a lot of uh, things, behavioral economics, data, research, knowledge. So that's why we move in JDC Israel at all and JDC Eshel specific from developing new services uh, to a large scale initiative. Uh, so this was uh, my presentation. I see that there are four questions I'll try to. Okay, um, the first question is, in the assessment and demographic metrics, is there consideration of illness, comorbidities, as well as other indicators such as smoking, drug, ETOH use? Uh, the answer is yes. <clears throat> I said that there are 80 uh, predictive indicator and there are big, big, um, um, department of indicators uh, which related to uh, illness and uh, most of those indicators that uh, you mentioned are in and like uh, a, a fa but by the way, uh, one of the main problem of older adults when they f uh, f uh, fall and uh, break their hips. So this is a another indicator. And if uh, uh, some of you uh, want to uh, be aware for all those indicators, we can share it with you and all the all the uh, the five years plan and all all the idea of this uh, on this um, a dashboard and indicator for optimal aging and those LSI. And uh, I also put in the chat a few links to some of the surveys and some other relevant uh, articles that Yossi was talking about. Um, there's another question. Um, 
Is there a plan to engage older people in volunteer initiatives to enhance meaning, not just paid employment? Yes, as, as you can see in the predictive, uh, in the, in the, uh, predictive uh, indicator, there is a uh, one indicator, one moment I'll get uh, to the slide, which call, um, we, in active lifestyle, there is a, a, what we call participant uh, in uh, social activities. And one of them is, uh, is a volunteering. By the way, I don't know if you saw it, but in Israel, when we talk about uh, volunteering in uh, all in uh, of older adult, we are uh, in a red situation compared to uh, the OECD. F uh, four years ago, I was in Denmark, and there the numbers of people who volunteers, uh, 65 and above, as, are above double if, you, if we compare it to Israel. But uh, yes, this is one of the indicator, and we are talking about co continue to be employed or. Um, to be to vol to volunteer volunteering is uh, in one of those indicators. Thank you. Um, there is a question here about specific statistics on Holocaust survivors, but I think we will leave that for the next speakers from the claims conference, uh, right, Miriam and Julie? Yeah. You're going to do? yeah, okay. Just just to say that in this um, in these surveys that we made, we have. Uh, um, uh, we measure uh, by ages some in some of those questions 65 75 75 85 85 and above we have some question about if you are arab immigrant from uh, from if a former soviet union and so on we don't have a specific uh, data uh, in this so in those surveys about holocaust survivors but uh, uh, in other surveys that we made and we uh, it uh, uh, enable our activities include with the uh, claim conference and other organization in Israel, we have specific uh, researches and survey for uh, Holocaust survivors. Okay, great. And we will hear more about Holocaust survivors uh, from, from the representatives here from the claims. Um, so Yossi, I want to thank you so much. It was an honor and a pleasure and fascinating to hear all of this. And uh, if you would like to stay with us still uh, for the rest of the program, it would be great. I'm here. So thank you. Okay, great. Um, before we move on to um, three of our members who will talk about um, their different angles of uh, philanthropy in this field, I want to share with you um, a short, hold on. Um, yes. Yes, um, there is a um, there is a um, great program in Israel called Slicha La Sheila. I guess in a direct translation, it's uh, excuse me for the question. And um, a few years back, there was one about every time they take a different topic that people don't know so much about, and they have all kinds of ideas about, and um, they uh, they do a program about it and. I'm going to show you just a few minutes from a, uh, one of these that they did about uh, with elderly people, and it's very relevant. Kama mehayom shelach at mevala levad. Shela metsuyenet. Mevala le? Mevala levad. Levad. Kama. Vami mikol ayom gam. Im eli lo ba, vani levad. Aben ba ochel iti tzoraim bolech. אז אני קוראים לבד, אבל אני לא משמם, יש כביסה לעשות, לנקות את הבית. כמעט לבד לא. לבד אני מבלה בקניות. זוגי לא רוצה להתעסק בזה. זה לבד. אני רוקדת, ריקודי עם, ריקודים סלונים. אני שרה במקהלה, אני בקורס לדרמה. אני, וזה דבר חדש לגמרי, מתופפת במעגל תופים על תוף גדול ג'מבה. האמת שאני רוב היום לבדי, לא מפני שאני בודדה או אני יודעת דברים כאלה. אני, לא, אני, לא נעים לי להגיד את זה, אבל אנשים לא מעניינים אותי שם. אני הרי גרה במושב זקנים. זה לא מושב, זה בית, איך הם קוראים? יש איזו מילה, בית אבות. אני שונאת את המילה הזו. זה מושב זקנים. חלק אומר שאני סנובית, ואני באמת סנובית כנראה, כי כל אחד מדבר 
שפה הוא מרגיש לא טוב, ופה הוא הלך לרופא, ופה הוא לא אכל, ופה הוא כן אכל, ופה הוא לא ישן, ופה הוא כן ישן. כמה כבר אפשר להסתכל לטלוויזיה? כמה כבר אפשר לקרוא בעיתון? כמה אפשר כבר לכתוב? אז יש לי שעות ריקות. אני נוהגת. אני נוסעת לתל אביב, לבית הפלמ"ח, ופוגשת... לפעמים קבוצות של תיירים או של ישראלים, ואני מספרת להם על הפלמ"ח, ואני מספרת להם על הצ'יזבטרון, שייקלה אופיר, גדעון זינגר, שלוימלה בר שביט, נעמי פולני, רבקה לקראמר, ועוד כמה דמויות שבאו ועברו והיו בצ'יזבטרון. אין, אפשר, אני שרה, זה היה עשיר. שלי, הסולו הגדול שלי, שאני אוהבת עד היום. היית רוצה יותר להיות בחברה, לצערי, עלייה וקוצמה. היות ואני בן 99, אפילו למי לטלפן כבר אין לי. פשוט, פשוט, אינם. נפטרו. היום אין לי, אין לי אדם אחד לדבר איתו. לשבת איתו, לשתות כוס קפה, לשחק שש באש, דומינו, דם כזה. אין. כולם נפטרו. מה לעשות, כולם נפטרו. יותר נעים לו להיות עם שולה. אה? יותר נעים לך להיות אצלי מאשר שם. לא, לא, לא. שאתה לבד בבית. לא. מסתדר. מנמנם. הלאה. אוקי דוק. אוקיי, אני חושב שאתם כולם יכולים לשמוע את זה. And uh, it's, it's uh, 25, and uh, hopefully you also saw the subtitles in English. Um, it's, uh, it's well worth seeing all of it. I just chose the, the one piece about um, loneliness, which I think is really relevant. Um, so um, now I would like to move on. And we will have three different members of JFN presenting their philanthropic model of engagement in this field. As well as COVID lessons learned in some cases, they will each give a short presentation followed by a Q&A. So I want to encourage you again to pop your questions in the chat if you have any um, during the presentation of each of, of them. Um, the first speakers in this category are from the Claims Conference. Miriam Weiner is Director of Allocations and Julie Chapnick is Director of Social Welfare Allocations. And um, uh, the microphone is yours, please. Thanks, Maya. And thanks, Yassi. That was a, a really excellent presentation. I've actually seen some of it before because Yassi and I have had the opportunity to speak, but it, it doesn't cease to fascinate me to really think about these predictors and indicators. And a lot of it, of course, resonates for services for survivors. Um, and also that video you just showed, it, it made me think about something we say at the claims conference. When you've met one survivor, You've only met one survivor. Everybody's experience is so different and the way they reacted to it and handled it and what happened to them and how they age, it's all different for people. So you can't, uh, you can't make assumptions based on you know, meeting one person. Anyway, the, the Claims Conference is an international NGO that's responsible for negotiating with uh, Germany and Austria for compensation and restitution for Holocaust survivors. In addition, we run a major grant making program, which in 2022 will allocate over $700 million for social welfare assistance for survivors living in over 40 different countries, as well as for Shoah research, education, and documentation. Um, the basic premise of our social welfare funding is to ensure that survivors, regardless of where they live, have a baseline of service that will enable them to live at home in safety and security for as long as possible. And while that may mean different things in different countries, depending on local government um, social safety nets, there is one very main common denominator that exists across the board internationally. And that is the tremendous dramatic need for home care, which is really the number one need that elderly, and in this case, survivors need in order to remain aging at home in their own, in their own homes. Home care can mean a range of things. It can mean housekeeping, cleaning. It can mean, um, personal care, bathing, dressing, feeding, um, and it relates to what Yassi talked about, IADLs, instrumental activities of daily living that are difficult for people, um, as well as a ADLs, people who can't really put on their clothes, can't bathe themselves, can't feed themselves. 
And for people who are medically fragile, home care can mean home nursing as well. So it really encompasses a wide array of things. And it is, it takes, a, it's about 75% of our funding goes to home care around the world. Um, and in Israel is also our largest program that we, we fund in Israel is for home care. And in fact, our largest single grant in the world is for home care in our partnership with the Foundation for the Benefit of Holocaust Victims in Israel. Um, for 2022, we'll be allocating over 400 million shekel for home care. And our model basically is to take what the government does and build up on top of it. So in Israel, um, elderly can be assessed for home care support through Bituach Lumi. It's based on a functional diagnosis as well as a financial assessment. And the claims conference in partnership with the government ministry, the authority for the benefit of Holocaust survivors, basically tops up for those low income low functioning survivors, an additional nine hours of home care every week. Um, in last, last year, it was about 35,000 survivors who were getting this additional home care services on top of what they get from Tua Khutumi. And the goal is obviously to be able to keep people living in their own homes. That is always the preference if that is possible. We also have a couple other models for home care in Israel, um, and that is a cash-based program. So for survivors who have live-in caregivers, 24-7 care, you, um, they can elect to get cash in lieu of service that can help defray the cost and really makes it much more affordable, not for everybody, but it really makes it much more affordable for survivors who have the ability to have a live-in um, choose that option. And for 2022, we're introducing a couple new categories for survivors who kind of fell between the cracks. So that would be um, survivors, for example, who are very low functioning, but their income is slightly above the Bituach Lumi um, cutoff, which means they get reduced hours. So for that, and there's another group that also may be very, very poor, but are slightly too functional <laughs> according to Bituach Lumi. So they don't meet the cutoff um, according to the functionality assessment as requiring home care, but you know what, if you're an 80 year old survivor, cleaning the bathrooms, doing the laundry, these are not safe activities for you to do. And so we're going to be introducing um, a monthly cash stipend for, low, for those two groups to help them um, be able to buy some additional home care. Um, and those that even those two smaller categories, which is about another 7,000 survivors um, is gonna cost about a hundred million shekel. So home care is a very expensive, an ongoing service, but it is, is really the most critical in order of safety and security to keep people at home. Beyond what the claims conference does for physically disabled survivors, we also try to support an array of services. And I think it kind of goes to the language, yes, use of quality of life, but addresses other elements like nutritional support and mental and physical well being for low income survivors. And we do that through a few programs. Um, that Eshel actually created, the day center program and supportive community programs and um, through soup kitchens. And for those of you who are not in Israel or who are in Israel and have never seen a day center, I encourage you to have an opportunity to go. It is an absolutely beautiful model where for a um, daily fee, a person can come, they are transported to and from the center and there's a robust um, array of services that are provided uh, both in grooming, in laundry services, in counseling, a hot meal, physical and occupational therapy, as well as fun things, arts and crafts, um, chair yoga. Uh, I need that one, by the way. <laughs> and and uh, they take them on trips when, when the situation allows it. And it really, it really gives people a sense of community, a sense of belonging, something to look forward to. And it also addresses some very critical, you know, mental and physical and mental health issues. So mental health, there's counseling, and also you get to socialize. And on the physical, they do grooming um, for people who are diabetics. They can do their nails, which is you know a risky thing for um, people with diabetes. So it really is a very beautiful program, but it does cost a daily fee. Low income elderly are subsidized by the government and the claims conference subsidizes it even more. So it really is reachable for any survivor who wants to go. We have programs in 113 day centers across the country and over 3000 survivors are going on a regular basis. Um, we also have some programs that are dedicated for mentally frail for Alzheimer's, which is great for them to help um, their mental and cognitive uh, involvement and is a really critical um, break, a respite for caregivers as well. Uh, the other program that Yassi mentioned, Supportive Communities, it, it, it was created in Israel, but it has been exported as a model in other parts of the world. 
And the concept is if there is a significant number of elderly living in a concentrated geographic area, they create a community out of it. And um, for a monthly membership fee, uh, there is an Av and Aim Bayit who are responsible for checking in on all the members of the community. You get a, an emergency alert button and there's a club like a Moadon where you can go to for activities, to hang out with other people, to socialize. The Av and Aim Bayit are available for whatever you need. You need a, something quickly, a light bulb change. You know, you don't wanna stand up on a ladder, they can do it. If you need more involved things like you need a plumber, an electrician, they will arrange it for you. So it also helps for healthy aging in place. Um, and we provide a subsidy for survivors. So it's basically affordable to any survivor who wants to participate. Um, we have programs in 85 different locations and over 9,000 survivors are being subsidized for the supportive community. Um, and lastly, in the area of nutritional support, we work primarily with soup kitchens throughout the country to provide hot meals, which again, it both goes to food and to social opportunities. You come together, it's a, an attractive looking room where you can sit and eat with other people. Unfortunately, because of COVID, the opportunity to eat in a, a, you know, a communal environment is not so safe. So mostly those programs have moved to Meals on Wheels, which is fine. And I, I hope one day we'll get back to you know, center-based um, food. And for packaged food, we have a great partnership with La Tete, which provides monthly food packages for survivors um, as well. And over, I think about 9,500 survivors are getting support through that. And we have other smaller programs for mental health counseling through AMCHA, which is an organization dedicated specifically to the needs of survivors, where you can get therapy both in their centers as well as at home if you are homebound. Um, and I think through that kind of, there are other smaller programs, friendly visitation programs and the like, but through that array, we're really trying to target the most physically disabled and the really poor, the low income people um, to be able to access services, to enable them to have quality of life and basic nutritional um, and emotional supportive support. Um, we are looking to launch two major initiatives in this year that I think also touches on things that Yassi mentioned. One is a model that exists in the United States and in Canada and in other parts of the world, but predominantly North America, which is called comprehensive case management, where there's a dedicated social worker whose caseload is entirely survivors, where he or she, but mostly she, is in touch with the survivors on a regular basis, figures out exactly their situation, connects them to the services that exist from philanthropic and government initiatives, and then when needed, also uses the claims conference funds for additional support. And in Israel, what we're seeing is that there's a tremendous amount of different local initiatives, and there's a lot of also government support for different things for survivors, for elderly and for survivors specifically, but it's hard to know how you find it all and how you access it all and how you are connected to it all. And it's something um, uh, Yassi and the claims conference has been talking about in the last uh, couple of weeks actually is maybe this is a model we can bring to Israel because Israel is unique in that it's the only place in the world where we pretty much know every single survivor. Right? There isn't that in other parts of the world where you can say you really know who they are and you can find them all. So I think this is a big opportunity. The other is a dental health um, initiative because the government did put in, um, in the last couple of years, increase the benefits. So pretty much basic dental care is free for elderly, but there is an out-of-pocket cost depending on the type of service you may need. And we don't want survivors to limit going to get their teeth taken care of because that is a big indicator for overall health. Um, we don't want them to not take care of their teeth because they have an out of pocket cost. And we're looking to see to launch a partnership this year with the government and with all the coupons to basically cover that out of pocket cost. Um, so those are two large scale initiatives we're looking to for this coming year. Um, and I guess in terms of just COVID, obviously, there was different, you know, we would have thought it was done, but, but it's not. But I think a lot of things have calmed down. So I think two things we learned is the amazing, amazing resilience of the social service agencies to continue to provide the services. Home care continued uninterrupted, really. So, you know, it was really everyone on above and beyond and the creativity and the resilience of our clients, truthfully, also survivors are very resilient, um, more or less, <laughs> but um, the creativity of the agencies to find ways to continue to provide the services despite what's going on. And then just one initiative that we're still doing right now is on a vaccine initiative with Hatsala, 
Um, we did a partnership. We are in a partnership with them. They've created a dedicated call center. We sent out letters to every survivor we know. We put ads in the newspaper and we said, get your boot vaccine or your booster and do not let transportation or being homebound be something that prevents you from going. And Hatzal is actually calling survivors and has been doing this for since the second shot was available to say, we can make your appointment, we can take you there and back. They are doing it now um, Now for the fourth for the fourth shot also. And luckily most survivors are able to get their vaccine if they want it um, on their own, but there is a group that needs assistance. And so I'm pleased with that initiative that we're helping, I think we've helped over about 730 survivors get um, either their vaccine or their booster. So I could talk more because I love to know Miriam, I survivors, but I'll go to Q&A if you want. Right. No, I, I was just going to say there's it's like you deserve a medal for trying for fitting all of that in the short time that you got. So uh, <laughs> I tend to talk quickly. That. Sorry. Yes. Um, and um, yeah, there, there are a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, I just want to make sure a story. Did you get the specific statistics that you were looking for? I don't see the questions in the chat, Maya, so I no, might need you to tell they me what they sent, are. No, they were sent directly to me, but oh, I'm just okay. asking, um, Astora asked for specific statistics on Holocaust survivors, so I was just wondering what... Uh, yeah, I was just looking at the, you know, the statistic that Yossi mentioned, if they uh -huh. had a specific uh, angle on, uh, uh, on Holocaust survivors to see the difference in the, between the two. But, oh, okay. uh, you know, we can do it offline. I mean, I don't think it's okay. good. All right, and uh, there's another question here. Um, uh, maybe Julie can answer. Um, are there programs that are supported by claims to support family caregivers? Ooh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> um, okay, Julie, you could answer or I could try to answer. The claims conference funding for now is really limited to survivors themselves. However, in that context, if a survivor is funded to get home care, that provides a relief for the caregiver spouse or the family member, right? So, and uh, the day center also, by the way, under Israeli, under Bituach Lumi rules, you can actually swap some of your Bituach Lumi hours of home care to go to a day center as well. So there's, op and the day center is obviously a tremendous um, benefit for family members because your loved one is cared for in a beautiful, very engaging way without you <laughs> for a big chunk of the day. But in terms of direct support, our direct support is only for survivors themselves at this time. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Julie, did you have something to add? No, it, exactly what Miriam said. All of our programs in a way support caregivers. If you're at the day center, you're in a safe place, the supportive community, someone's checking on you, especially if you live far away, if you're not in Israel or if you are and you just don't live close by the mental health. So all of our programs in a way, but as Miriam said, our funding currently is just earmarked for survivors directly. Okay, so thank you both very much. Obviously the, the Holocaust survivors is a, is a big part of uh, the elderly in Israel. Um, so it's always um, uh, an important topic. So thank you for that. Um, it was a very comprehensive overview. Um, our next speaker is a JFN member Astore Modena, and he will present his involvement for the, from the perspective of digital literacy. So uh, Astore, you have uh, seven minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, all. Uh, first of all, I have to say that I'm far from being an expert in the field. I think uh, after hearing Yossi and Miriam uh, talk, uh, you know, I have to be a little bit uh, uh, prosperous to, to to talk about the field, uh, but what I was asked to, to do is to try and give you a quick uh, overview of one of the programs that we did in my nonprofit organization called Machshava Tova. Uh, so I'll start with a brief introduction. Uh, Yossi knows it quite well. We're working with them very, very closely. Um, so uh, first of all, Machshava Tova, the name uh, means a good thought in, in English. It's a, in, it's a name of, it's a game uh, on the name uh, Machshev and, uh, and Good Thought. Um, and our goal is to narrow the social gap through technology and personal empowerment. Um, the organization was founded uh, about 20 years ago by myself and some others. Uh, our main focus is actually uh, youth and kids, but we have worked with elderly population for a while uh, in the last 10 years. 
Uh, we work nationwide. We work with all uh, different local populations, Arabs, Haredi, uh, Jews, anywhere. And uh, we've worked with more than 100,000 participants uh, all over the years. And uh, in the last uh, years, except especially with, uh, with the Joint Asian Program, uh, we have worked in, uh, uh, in what's called the National Program for Digital Literacy. Uh, so gaining a lot of experience uh, with elderly population uh, on the digital uh, literacy side. Uh, in terms of the, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about what happened during COVID. Uh, I think a lot was presented here, so you can understand uh, in an organization like ours that is was giving uh, courses uh, to elderly as well as youth, et cetera, in a physical situation, we had to change very, very quickly our model. And we tried to see how we can help the populations uh, by basically solving some of the issues that uh, Yossi mentioned uh, at the beginning. Uh, so again, the, the digital literacy, the community sector, the loneliness, uh, etc. And what we what we did, and this was done over three days. I don't know if you remember those times. Uh, we're talking about March 2020. Uh, basically, from the day to tomorrow, uh, the government decided to put all of us in uh, in Seger, you know, enclosure. Um, so pretty much everything that we were doing until now was closed. And uh, and the team of Machshavatova managed within three days. Uh, to basically move everything that we were doing um, physically uh, to remote. And uh, remote for elderly people is not obvious and definitely was totally uh, not obvious then when nobody knew what Zoom was, etc. Uh, so what we did was to start a, a program of uh, basically daily courses twice a week, twice a day on a difficult on a different range, of uh, technology subjects to provide digital literacy uh, through a remote uh, uh, through a remote way. Basically, what we're trying to do physically moving into remotely within three days, and uh, and basically the the courses were were given uh, uh, again twice daily uh, through Zoom at the same time uh, to just give a, a path to the for the elderly. We had a very smart idea to have a call center. Uh, where about eight volunteers were talking to elderly people to uh, manage to give them access to the classes. Again, nobody knew what Zoom was at the time. And that was really tough. I mean, each of the conversation were at least half an hour to be able to achieve it. Um, all courses were recorded. So they were available for people that missed it or uh, you know wanted to exercise. And beyond the tech subjects, and I, I connect with uh, what Yossi mentioned before, uh, we were giving courses in uh, exercise to yoga classes and uh, similar, uh, a lot of uh, cultural classes on different topics, uh, travel, uh, museums, etc. And all these were done by volunteer, which liked our, our platform and uh, went to, to the platform. Uh, here are some numbers. So in total, uh, over a year and a half of our activity, we had 60,000 participants, uh, about 15,000 unique users. Uh, and so an average of four, uh, four classes per person, but uh, uh, you know, most of them were doing a, a very large number of classes. Um, most of the, our audience was women, uh, about 63% uh, doing also with mobile. And the other thing which was very interesting is because of the fact that it was all remote, we actually managed to export the model to Italy. Uh, that was actually my idea. I come from Italy originally, and uh, we managed to do it also in Italy, less successful than the Israeli side, but I think it was, uh, it was quite interesting. Um, so we don't have much time. I want to give you a little bit of the results uh, that we had uh, in the program. And this has come from a, a survey that we did uh, in the middle of the program. Uh, so we see that more than 60% of the, of the people that responded to the survey attended more than 20 live courses courses, and five recorded ones, which means that most of the people that attended were actually uh, people that, uh, you know, hooked up almost daily to our, uh, to our programs. Um, more than 50% uh, still after many months use extensively the tools learned, and another 40% use them sometime, which is very impressive. 
Uh, and the other thing which is very important, the fact that uh, we, we, we taught, uh, you know, a lot of the different uh, courses, but the fact that we managed to give them the ability and the, <coughs> sorry, the empowerment to be able to connect to technology meant that they went to see also other tools, sorry. Uh, so more than 40% actually <coughs> started using other tools which we didn't um, teach. Uh, more than 70% felt a big improvement in the skill set and want to learn more. And most importantly, more than 70% of them <coughs> were in much better mood thanks to the program. The fact that they, uh, you know, they, they could uh, attend the course was a big, uh, big hit also on their mood, not just on their literacy uh, skills. These are some of the quotes you can see here. One very important one is they reduce my fear of computers. One of the biggest issues of elderly people with uh, computers or uh, digital in general is they have a fear. They have uh, um, they don't even want to start. And I think that <coughs> by bridging this um, initial pace, that was a very important topic, a very important uh, step. Um, it was very important during the time of closures. Uh, we built with them a daily routine. They could actually, you know, wake up and know that tw <coughs> twice a day uh, they could attend a, a specific course. That was very important, um, and it was extremely important to improve their self-esteem in front of the kids, their kids, and uh, and their grandkids, uh, because they were always the ones that needed help and suddenly they could be independent and use all the tools that their kids uh, use. And even, even sometimes I attended myself some of the courses, I can tell you that I even myself learned new things. So I think, you know, probably they also uh, taught their kids some of the new things they learned. Um, just a few words about uh, uh, what I believe were the key success parameters that we had. Um, we had a human helpless, that was a key. Uh, key uh, success parameter. It's uh, the fact that we, you know, at the beginning was well, someone that they could call uh, to if they have any problem with connecting, just to understand a bit more about the program. The, the initial, uh, I would say, human connected was extremely important in the beginning. We had dedicated teacher which knew how to teach to elderly. We had dedicated material, very, very specific, very slow and uh, to the right pace for the elderly people. Um, we never gave anything for granted. Sometimes, you know, we youngsters, uh, you know, believe that some of the things are obvious. Uh, they're not obvious for 90% of the elderly. Uh, so every single thing that we would teach, we have to really start from a very uh, basic, uh, basic uh, uh, tools. Um, it was very important to have a human touch. The teacher was extremely personal with the students. Even if we had an average 60, 80 students, they would call it with their names and, uh, and say, how are you doing? And, you know, very, very personal. Um, and that is the thing with which we had time where basically, you know, we put the, the Zoom mode where everybody could see each other. And it was very important for them to see each other, to have to see part of the to be part of a community, to be part of a, of a group that actually sees each other, even if they cannot, could not do it physically. Um, it was very important to do it in small modules uh, so that you know, they could really grasp one piece at a time and do a lot of exercises, which uh, of course for elderly people is very important. Um, the other thing which was uh, also critical was that we were actually solving real problems uh, once they got to a certain level of literacy we would ask them to uh, give us uh, examples of what they need and do it uh, in the in the lesson as well, and that was very helpful and also, uh, you know, showed them that we cared. Um, as a funder, I you know I tried to write here a little bit some of the some of the general uh, lessons I learned from the process. Uh, first of all, you know the the crisis of the COVID was a huge opportunity, as the Chinese say, for us. It really pushed us out of the comfort zone big time and allowed us to see that we can actually do much more things remotely. And even for the elderly, which is probably the last population I ever thought 
of uh, doing it remotely, we were able to do it uh, also with them. Um, the other thing uh, which is very important is, is it, it's really the, the COVID was a super stressful situation for us, but it's exactly there where you see the flexibility, the open-minded uh, of the people, the really motivation of the people. So for me, it was an amazing lesson of how uh, the resilience, flexibility, and strength of our organization was. Um, the other thing which is important on the economical side, it was very important that we had a buffer because for a few months, uh, you know, all our activities were almost go to zero. The, this program was completely for free. Then we were able to uh, receive money for this operation, but because we had the buffer, we were able to invest in the change without uh, uh, thinking too much of uh, uh, the expenses. Um, and the other thing, which is connected to, to uh, elderly in general, is you, you can never estimate how much motivation there is uh, to learn at any age. Uh, you know, you had people 90 years old uh, still wanting to learn, you know, how Facebook and Instagram works. Um, and, uh, and the other thing which was important in the, in the process was uh, we were extremely transparent and generous with the team. I don't know if you remember, we had a lot of people uh, wearing halat at the time, you know, in the, uh, how do you say, in... Uh, Sorry, you have only one more minute left, so... Yes, I pretty much finished. Um, so, you know, it's very important to, to show to the team that you care, but also very be transparent on your decisions, uh, be very personal with them, so that, you know, in, in ups and downs of the situation, you can really uh, manage the organization properly. Um, I want to just uh, thank you all. Uh, this is uh, one of the uh, messages from the elderly population. Uh, thank you and big hug. So thank you very much and I'll be happy to answer any question. Thank you, Astora. Yeah, there's a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, is there a maximum number of people who can join a live class? Yeah, so um, we, we, we use at the beginning the normal Zoom. Uh, which has a limit of 100 people. Um, at a certain point, we realized that uh, we had to increase it, but it was mostly for the very special events. We did, for example, one event for Yom HaShoah. Uh, so, of course, a lot of uh, people were interested in the, in the topic. So we had like, I don't know, 250 people uh, for, for our events. Uh, for a normal class, I think that, uh, you know, the, we could handle very well the 60, 70 people, you know, most of them don't uh, don't have a lot of questions uh, live. We leave only the last uh, few minutes for for questions, so it was uh, manageable. Um, but th that was uh, usually the numbers we had. I don't know what would have happened if we had, uh, you know, 150, 200 people at any given time. Thank you. One more question. Um, how did the participants find out about the availability of these programs? Was there a fee to participate? So it was totally free, uh, first of all. Uh, we realized that, uh, you know, uh, the elderly population was in uh, probably the, the worst situation ever in COVID. They were, if you remember, in March, they were completely closed. Nobody could uh, get out of the house. Uh, so we decided that uh, we would uh, give it as a service. Uh, we usually do charge in, in almost all our activity a symbolic fee. Uh, but in this case, we decided to put it to zero because uh, uh, we wanted really to reach everybody. Um, and uh, uh, sorry, the second question was about, oh, how they knew about the problem. So yes. we, in Mashavatova in general, we work a lot with partners. Uh, so we, uh, we initially had a... Um, uh, already a partnership with a number of institutions that uh, were bringing the audience, if you like. And once we started this, uh, this project, and this was on the physical side, once we started the remote project, uh, we decided to do some advertising as well uh, in, in some uh, channels. Um, I can tell you from my Italian experience that the, that the channel advertising was not very successful. It's mostly about the partners that you choose. So I would say that 90% of the uh, audience came from uh, our partnerships. And, and I would say 10, maybe 5% come from, uh, um, actually more than that, probably came from, uh, um, how do you say, mouth to ear. 
you know, people uh, uh, Word of mouth. Other, other the people to talk to talking to their friends and telling them about this new program, and maybe another two three percent from the uh, marketing that we we did. Thank you very much, Astor, and special thanks because you joined us when, we, when you're actually not feeling well at all. So thank God it was a virtual session and not a face-to-face. Yeah. And uh, thank you very much. Um, I would like to uh, present to you Joseph Gittler, who will present his work in the field of food security. And the stage is yours, Joseph. Thank you very much, Maya. And thank you all for staying on till the bitter end but it's been incredibly interesting. And I wanna thank the JFN team for putting together uh, such an interesting uh, group of speakers on a topic that's dear to my heart and obviously dear to all of yours. And thank you to Yossi, Miriam and Astor uh, for setting the stage and for talking about some of the big picture items and the big, uh, and then also honing in onto some you know, large but smaller initiatives. And that's really the way we look at our work at Leket when it comes to our work uh, with the elderly. And that is, we're just a small part of a much, much bigger picture. Um, and it's quite scary actually, when I think about it after hearing you know, some of the previous speakers, how much work needs to be done and how endless it seems and how much it, uh, how difficult the job is ahead of us. But you know, we really look at it as something, we're trying here to fill in the gaps, okay? And so where, you know, as big as the claims conferences and as big as JDC is and, and doing, you know, staggering amount of work throughout the uh, Jewish world and in Israel specifically, uh, there's still, it's, you know, it's impossible to get to everyone. So very briefly, for those who are not familiar uh, with the work of LEC at Israel, we are a national food rescue organization. We primarily work with two areas of food and that is we work very closely with what I'll call the catering community hotels, corporate cafeterias, the IDF, um, event halls, making sure that all their excess food uh, doesn't go to waste. And in addition, we also work very, very closely with the farming community, whether it be farmers themselves, kibbutzim, moshavim, packing houses, to make sure that excess crops don't get to waste. And as you all know, uh, food waste is an absolutely staggering uh, area. You know, the statistics we hear that we produce every year talk about 40 to 50% of food that's produced, uh, imported, manufactured, goes to waste. And of course, uh, Israel, like most other Western countries, has a significant poverty issue. And uh, you know, maybe most damning in some ways is the type of poverty that we see in our elderly population. So that's big picture. Lek at works through a network of 300 feeding agencies throughout the country. Those are our partners. We primarily distribute food through these partners. And I'll tell you how COVID changed some of that and, and specific to the elderly. Uh, we had to add a hundred new partners just since COVID started uh, because thankfully due to support, we've been able to increase uh, our amount, the amount of food that we're collecting and distributing. Um, couple, so just a couple of uh, specifics. Um, and well, maybe I'll just say this first also. One of the ways we look at our role is enabling the agencies we serve to focus their work on what they do, right? So if you take a, you know, a, uh, like one of these clubs or hostels for the elderly, as we spoke about, or an after school club for kids, feeding is just one piece of the bigger picture. But the big picture is rehabilitation, education, uh, keeping people from being lonely. So when Leckett can, provide food to those agencies, it may mean that they can then spend less time fundraising or they can serve more people or they can give out more food to the people that they're serving already. And in many cases, it just means that in the elderly or families uh, just with their limited budgets now can spend their money on something else. And of course we're getting the food for free. So we're a highly leveraged organization despite our logistical costs. So just some specifics um, with distribution to the elderly. So uh, like was mentioned before, COVID has wreaked havoc with the elderly population in Israel. And what it meant for Leket is that many of the agencies that we serve closed uh, by April, 2020 were closed, remained closed for a long time. Some have continued to remain closed, which of course makes distribution by us challenging because generally we're not a direct 
service providers. So of course, at the height of COVID, desperate times called for desperate measures, and we did whatever we had to do, uh, took staff members who normally are volunteer coordinators or doing other work that dried up during COVID and turned them into delivery people. We recruited very brave volunteers, considering if we think about where we were at the beginning of COVID, not that we've uh, progressed much, but um, you know, people going out, uh, you know, like I call them one and a half, you know, they're not the first responders, but maybe, you know, second responders putting on hazmat suits, delivering food directly to people door to door. We had a lot of cooperation at the time from municipalities who we generally don't work with, with the IDF, companies who had trucks idled and were providing them to us. It was a really great uh, period. As you can imagine, the cooked meals that Leckett gets almost completely dried up. Uh, during the height of COVID. And again, thanks to our partners, uh, old and new, uh, people came forward in a very strong way, enabling Leket since March 2020 to purchase over one and a half million cooked meals, primarily from places that give us food for free. So the same hotels, the same corporate cafeterias uh, that were suffering and putting people uh, on leave or firing them, in some small way, we were able to help them. That direct delivery to the elderly has mostly dried up, primarily for some reasons because of budgetary reasons, and also because we're thankfully about 80% back to where we were. So if we were distributing 10,000 meals a day, pre-COVID, we're up to about 8,000, and we're seeing improvement. Although again, with what's going on now, while I don't think the government of Israel will shut, shut us down, things are shutting down just because of the way that the new variant is spreading, at least you know, for those of you who live in Israel on this call and whose kids uh, seem, if you could do any less in the Israeli school system, they, are fi they finally found a way to do less, my children. So anyone who's that in a situation, I feel bad for you as well. Um, so we've continued direct delivery though, just as one example in a very specific area, and that's where we haven't found solutions. So I know, for example, that we continue to purchase about 300 meals a day in the Tzvat area where we haven't found, uh, haven't been able to find the food that we were getting for free previously. And so in that case, we continue to purchase and we've budgeted for 2022 to continue that throughout the year, which may not sound like a lot, 300 meals a day, but when you start doing the math, suddenly you're talking about 85,000 meals times 15, 20 shekels. And you know, I'm not so good at math, but it's a heck of a lot of, of money. Um, one other, I think, and, and I'll try to finish with this. Um, obviously, when we talk about COVID lessons, so like it's, as a flexible organization, even though we've become a pretty big organization, uh, we have to continue to remain very, very flexible. And I think the best example is a new project that we started in September. And we started it because uh, we had a unique problem. And that is over the last two years, uh, everything's come together with us when it comes to our work with um, farmers. Uh, we finished 2021 doubling the amount of agriculture that we rescued and redistributed over the past two years from 13,000 to 26,000 tons. To put that into perspective, we are now distributing for a million pounds uh, every week throughout the state of Israel to our 300 agency partners. It's massive, massive amounts of logistics. That created a unique problem though, even though we added 100 agencies, we've found it extremely difficult to distribute everything in the way that we're used to. And, you know, chas v'shalom, it would be terrible if Leket started to waste food that we, you know, raise money for in order to run our logistics. So in September, we piloted a new project in order to extend the shelf life of our vegetables specifically and to give us more time to distribute them we started a pilot soup project where we work, we're working with the Israeli soup manufacturer and there are not that many. That's not a big thing in Israel manufactured soup. So it hasn't been so easy to find a partner. We did 10,000 soups in September as a test case. Distributed, we freeze them, gives us six months to distribute them. They're high quality and they are only distributed to homebound elderly who we're also usually distributing cooked meals to as well. We got incredible uh, response to this project from the agencies we serve who've always asked us to add value to the food 
from the elderly who we surveyed, and this is now a, you know, for, for some people, this can be a meal, okay? And it's very, and so we decide we'd like to, you know, budgets uh, being raised, of course, to uh, produce a minimum of 250,000 soups in calendar year 2022. The demand is there. Um, it's high quality, it's nutritious, and it's the kind of project, at least from the outset, that we're getting very, very strong response to from anyone we talk about it to. Um, thank you. I think I've said enough. Um, if there are any yes, questions I'm for me, happy to take them. Um, and we're running out of time, and I also want to be respectful of the time. Um, but thank you so much. And it's so inspiring to hear all these uh, projects and the corporations. Um, so it's really great. I somehow there's I always run out of run out of uh, time. And uh, we won't really have time for an actual discussion. Um, oh, sorry, I just see a, uh, one quick question. Will the Shemitah year impact getting produce from farmers? Okay, so Shemitah, which is the, you know, the seventh year keeping, um, keeping the land fallow, it has very little impact on Leket because the Jewish people, except for certain topics, but that's for another JFN discussion, we're very good at creating end, ra end runs in Jewish law. So like some of us may sell our chametz, our leavened bread before Passover. So the uh, very smart rabbis of Israel came up with a way to sell the land. And so most farmers, Jewish farmers, by the way, the Shemitah does not at all um, exist for non-Jewish farmers. So all Arab farmers in Israel, it's irrelevant. And, not, and so they don't have to change their practice and we can continue to purchase from them. Uh, very few farmers in Israel, although it does grow each Shemitah cycle, uh, very few farmers in Israel are keeping Shemitah. So it's a small impact for Leket on our um, getting crops. Where we do see a little bit of impact is there's certain ultra-Orthodox organizations specifically, you know, who don't abide by what's called the Heter Mechira, selling the land. And so then Leket, um, and I wish it was a problem to find new partners to distribute these crops to, but we've never had a problem up till now. So I hope that answers the question. Please reach out to me privately if you want to hear more. Yeah, I actually want to encourage all of you because we, we had wonderful speakers, but a lot of people who are on this call are also very involved in this area. And this is, uh, I, I want to encourage all of you to be in touch with us at JFN and also with anyone here that you, you met on this Zoom call. And we really want to continue this conversation. We want this space to be open. It's not only about um, aging, it's also about healthcare and well being, as I said in the beginning, and how it touches actually every any area of giving that you might be involved in. So, um, please uh, keep the communication open if you have any ideas or if you want to continue being in conversation with anyone who was in this meeting today. You can always contact us um, at JFN Israel and um, I want to thank each and every one of the speakers and each and every one of you for being here today. And we will just continue the conversation. It's just never enough time. And um, thank you all and have a great rest of your day or great evening. <laughs>